Many thanks even for your very kind words and uh, it's lovely to be here uh, in Belfast as always. And an unexpected treat that when I saw my good friend and former teammate Keith Crossan, who has also uh, played with Trevor, myself and Keith played together in the back three for Ireland. And Trevor is uh, a great friend and he was also in, in, involved in, in getting me to come up here, but, which I was delighted to do today because I've had some good experiences at the Irish Association and it's a real privilege to be asked. Um, to speak. Now the first time that I got met one of the Ringland families wasn't a sort of a great experience although I was playing with Trevor and we were playing against Australia in the first, in the first cap in 1980, 1981 and every time we had, a, we had a player called Tony Ward who was a really brilliant player but he kept pushing the back line across the field and so every time I had the ball it was nearly running towards the touch line and we wanted to protect this young guy Trevor Ringland who we didn't, who didn't need no, no protection. But his father, Adrian, who was a very passionate supporter, was kind of stand, sitting, he didn't realize that he was sitting in the stand next to the people who were the closest in numbers. So I was number 15, Trevor was number 14. Uh, and so all through the match, my then girlfriend at the time was listening to, give the ball to Trevor, give the ball to Trevor. <laughs> McNeil, you give the ball to Trevor. You're an absolute waste of space, McNeil, give the ball to Trevor. So afterwards, we were all in the, in the, underneath the stand at Lansdowne Road, and this was fine, and I was grand, and Trevor came over. And this is my dad, and he said, oh, great to meet you, Hugo, great to meet you. And this is, this is his girlfriend. And he turned around and said, oh, I think we've met before. And she said, yes, I think we, I think, I th I think, I think we have. On another occasion, um, when Trevor was, I was, was picked on the team, and I wasn't was playing, in 1988, we were playing Scotland, and I came on... Uh, and Trevor was being taken off in the ambulance as they were sort of going out of, out, of, out of Lansdowne Road. And suddenly this huge roar goes up and it's clear that Ireland have scored. And as Trevor turned to the guys, as long as that McNeil hasn't scored in my position. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately I have. But the, uh, unfortunately I had. But the questions that Trevor sort of poses and even very kind in asking about questions when he talked about so you're coming up to speak at this lunch and I, he said I want to get involved with the association in a number of things where we put ourselves challenges and the challenge that Trevor put uh, to me and was saying that was oh we've messed up a lot of relationships on this island over the past hundred years and starting on January 1st are we going to do better over the next hundred years and that's an easy kind of thing to say but what are the kind of things that we have to challenge ourselves you know, there's been much talk recently on the topic of the border poll on Irish unity. Reference is always made to the Good Friday Agreement and it's saying in the agreement that if, there's a, if it appears that there's a basis for it, the, the Secretary of State can call a referendum. But what gets much less attention, if attention at all, is what is in the first two paragraphs of the Good Friday Agreement. When it talks about the absolute uh, need to have focus on tolerance and reconciliation. The really important thing, I would say, is that they are not just crucial for those who would support a border poll, but also crucial for those who would maintain and seek to defend the support the union, and indeed for those who do not define themselves along religious or constitutional lines, or those who reflect new nationalities who have come to make Northern Ireland their home. Those who want Northern Ireland to fill the tremendous potential it, it has for all its citizens. And that also for the people who are generally happy with how things are today as illustrated by Pete Sherlow's most recent survey at the University of Liverpool. So on page two, the document reads, we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust and the protection and vindication of human rights of all. On page three of the referent, it, of the Good Friday Agreement reads, we will endeavour to strive in every practical way towards reconciliation and rapprochement. Now topics such as tolerance and reconciliation are, are sometimes seen as rather soft topics, nice to have but not need to have. How I, I would respectfully argue that in the context that you, you will know much better than I of the very specific and at times very painful history of Northern Ireland, they're anything but soft or peripheral aspects. True reconciliation and tolerance remain crucially unfinished parts of the Good Friday Agreement. I'll contend in this short address that there are absolute requirements not only for a Northern Ireland that works for the majority of its citizens today with specific acknowledgement of the growing number of citizens who are not defining themselves in a traditional binary way. They're actually the essential pre-requirements for a Northern Ireland or North which reflect the longer term ambitions of both the major traditions, either a United Ireland or a Northern Ireland remaining and flourishing in the United Kingdom. It's highly questionable whether the Republic would vote for unity with a Northern Ireland that was not at peace with itself 
reflecting much greater levels of toleration, uh, tolerance and reconciliation than are evident today. I'd also respectfully argue from a unionist perspective, a reconciled Northern Ireland is likely to engender a much more positive view from the rest of the United Kingdom than might at times seem as exists today. The Republic, given its role in the agreement, it needs to make sure it's consistently aligned with the spirit of set out above. The aspiration towards the United Ireland is an entirely legitimate one. Many have held it for a long time and consider it as a genuine dream to be re realised. Many nationalists in the North had to endure a lack of civil rights for a prolonged period and they felt abandoned by the Republic. Even though these have been largely addressed, although issues such as Irish Language Act can be seen as divisive at times, and can seen a, a considerable passage of time, the effects what they saw as a lack of respect still can be seen. But the attitude of people like Seamus Mallon, as set out in his biography, A Shared Home Place, was to not only to seek a united Ireland, but more importantly, to focus on creating conditions in which it might work. Now, at the same time, many attitudes in the Republic towards Northern Ireland remain absolutely simplistic or largely fail to understand the unionist position. Many travel north rarely, if at all, unless they're based in the border regions. The history that we're all taught of in, 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 in Irish history in the Republic is the story of the journey with its ups and downs or backwards and forwards to being an independent, and that meant being not British. Therefore, it's sometimes hard in the for a lot of people in the Republic to genuinely feel, appreciate what it means to be Irish and British and Northern Irish at the same time. And that's what even seen most recently in the sort of Irish Times survey, where lots of people were theoretically in favour of United Ireland, but when it came on to, would, would they actually make any compromises? There actually was very little that was to be seen. BT Sport made a documentary on how rugby brought people together on this island, independent of their political or constitutional allegiances. Two former teammates and British and Irish Lions, Rory Best and Brian O'Driscoll, were, dis were, were discussing it. Brian from Dub Dublin, Rory Best, MBE, I think I'm right in saying. And Br R Brian says to Rory, I don't really get it, Rory. You know, you're Irish, you play for Ireland, and yet you're British at the same time. And Rory said, yeah, that's actually what I am. And it wasn't meant to be provocative or rude or threatening from, from, from Brian O'Driscoll, but it's his attitude reflects a very widespread attitude in the, in the, in the Republic that don't fail, that fail to appreciate um, what it means to be British and Irish at the same time. But also, and it's re recently reflected, as I said, most recently in the Irish Times surveys over the past few, few days. And it echoes the well-known point emphasised by Ulster poet John Hewitt when expressing the various components of her identity. I've always maintained that our loyalties had an order to Ulster, to Ireland, to the British archipelago, to Europe, and that anyone who skipped a step or missed a link falsified the total. There's still re relatively little understanding or real discussion in the Republic of the key issues, both emotional and practical for Ulster Unionists. More importantly, there is little real engagement on these topics. Despite the constant claims of some groups that everything is up for debate, little generosity of spirit has yet been seen. Issues such as rejoining the Commonwealth, the importance of the British monarchy, the importance of the Somme, a re meaningful role for Stormont, a new flag and constitution, the NHS, the Somme, July the 12th, and so on and so on. Every year at the start of the rugby season, there are letters to the Irish Times complaining about the use of Ireland's call as the sort of song that should reflect the identity of the sort of the people who are representing Ireland that day. Um, there's even, you often even get criticism that actually Ireland's call is inhibiting the performance of the team, which is uh, until you point out to the people who are making that point that the two most successful teams in rugby history, New Zealand and South Africa, both explicitly changed their anthems to reflect all the identities of the people that were representing the team to today. And as you said, you know, I say people often in the Republic, if you're having a problem with Ireland's call, wait till you get on to the really difficult issues. A younger generation is growing up in the Republic who have no memory of the horrors of the Troubles. The distance of the Troubles, that's obviously a good thing in one respect, but one, res one often sometimes hears simplistic comments in the Republic uh, uh, ex expressed among younger Southerners. How is this going to be addressed? At the same time, I'd respectfully suggest that there is a need for unionists to develop a more constructive and inclusive unionism. This is both necessary for a Northern Ireland that works for all its citizens, but also in terms of get from the engendering a more positive attitude from the rest of the United Kingdom. And having lived, and I say this respectfully and deferentially, for, all, for 20 years in England and continuing an active engagement in British-Irish affairs since then, I've seen many examples of detachment who has provided and who will provide a positive, inclusive vision of Northern Ireland to the rest of the United Kingdom. 
Anthony Kenny, a former master of Balliol and one of the founders of the British Irish Association, said back in the 70s when asked as the attitude with Britain's attitude to, to Northern Ireland and said it used to be based, based on sentiment, self-interest and morality. The morality part was we're not going to get bombed out by Hitler and we were not going to get bombed out by the IRA. And so what of the sentiment, but those, those expressions of sentiment and self-interest and seeing a real role are something that needs to be rebuilt and that sort of have a positive inclusive unionism, I would respectfully suggest, would help and get, engender that in the rest of the United Kingdom. But when you talk of the United Kingdom, this is all set in the context of a United, further potential shifts in the UK itself. The United Kingdom itself had been previously set in, not in stone, but in set in, in, in structure for a very prolonged period of time. And then of course, first came along the Scottish referendum, which set certain forces at play. Where are they going and where will they land? A recent paper by Professor Kieran Martin at the Blavatnik School of Government in Oxford talked of a scenario where a London government might have to prevent another referendum based on law rather than the consent of the Scottish people. What would be the consequences for that in the Union? After the Scottish referendum came Brexit and all that involved and I don't need to tell this audience about the various aspects of that. And even recently a Welsh official at the embassy in Dublin described to me how Welsh nationalism was seeing a rebirth. Where that would lead it's hard to imagine. And I remember some years ago being at a British Irish Association committee where Scotland and Wales were being discussed and the former ambassador to Dublin and a senior civil servant was sitting there as the debate around Scotland and Wales went on shaking their heads uh, and I remember just thinking about this, saying this is all getting very tiresome and I remember thinking the sleeping giant of English nationalism is, is kind of awake and it's something that we've seen over the past over the past few years a trend we've only seen then so Ulster Unionists deserve better than this, but we need to, I respectfully say, have constructive and inclusive leadership, and I salute all those who have tried to do this. And all of this, unfortunately, is happening against a worsening British-Irish relations. It didn't seem so long ago, following the visit of Her Majesty the Queen to the Republic and the reciprocal visit of President Michael D. Higgins to, the, to England, basically, that you could not go to a British-Irish event of any kind without somebody starting in the opening lines of relations between our islands have never been better. That seems like a long time ago. And how are we going to change that with the, the governments that are in place in both sides of the, uh, the, the Irish Sea? Some success on... Yes, well, that's what I, you've, you've answered my question, yeah. How, 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 you know, I was, how, how dependent on that would you want to be? Some success on the protocol, would, would we want to be counting on that? There are still huge issues, and that's even without getting into issues I don't want to get into because I'm not qualified to speak about it, such as legacy. Can progress be made overall without real progress in this, in this area? Whatever this means, how are we meant to move forward whilst absolutely respecting the views of the relatives of the victims? There's a strong possibility maybe that Sinn Féin could be in government in the Republic, at least in the not too distant future. And if they are, the democratic mandate must be respected. But how can their objective of a united Ireland be made to work given the history? What needs to be done? Professor Liam Kennedy of Queen's University made a number of interesting remarks in a recent paper. The legacy of death and pain cannot be left out of any unity debate. The troubles on the aftermath of a half century of unionist hegemony cannot be left out. The background being that 60% of deaths were caused by Republican paramilitaries, 30% by loyalists, and 10% by security forces. He went on to write, the values that shaped the insurgency have never been challenged within the party, Sinn Féin, and are incompatible with a pluralist united Ireland. Public apologies can be forward-looking, ethical foundations are a prerequisite, not an afterthought. Fintan O'Toole wrote something similar in the Irish Times last week when he suggested that the behaviour of ETA, the Spanish Basque separatist organisation, was an example to Sinn Féin in making an apology for the actions of the IRA. This, he and Kieran Martin both suggested, was actually in Sinn Féin's interest by potentially helping create an atmosphere in which there would be wider acceptance of them in power over and above the bare democratic mandate. It would also be open to loyalist groups to offer a similar apology. I don't claim for a minute that this would be easy? Is this something that could be done? How do we do relationships better? I'd respectfully suggest that despite some comments to the contrary, Taoiseach Michal Martin has tried to show a consistent commitment to an understanding of Northern Ireland issues over his political career. He has talked about going north and to his days as foreign, as foreign minister and also in getting to know people outside the formal meetings uh, that, that, that took place. 
that's something that we can recognize through our work in the British Irish Association and something that I would say that you aim to with the work of the Irish Association. Where there's sometimes the main benefits are the conversations that are held outside the set piece events. In addition to the BIA, I consider myself very lucky that I, through, through rugby, it brought me to Northern Ireland through, for many years to different places all around, to Belfast, to Bangor, to Donegadee, Dungannon, Derry, Londonderry and, and so on. People used to say that you play, it was great that you all played together and the troubles, the situation was never mentioned. I always thought that was fine as far as it went, but I didn't think it went very far because if you had got to know somebody and respect somebody through the pressures of international rugby, how could you not sit down with them and actually try and say, let me try and understand a little bit more where you're coming from. And so we did talk, principally with Trevor, but with Keith and others. And I learned so much uh, about that in those, in, in those dialogues. We have to encourage that uh, as well. After the Canary Wharf bombing in 1996, I, together with Trevor, organized a Peace International in Dublin, which brought the best players in the world to play a match against Ireland in a, in a statement of anti-IRA and other terrorist activity. It was captained by Francois Pinar, whose image the previous year as captain of the South African team that had won the World Cup, receiving the World Cup from the President Nelson Mandela, wearing the, apart the Springbok jersey, which had been for such a long time the symbol of apartheid. And Francois came and he captained the team that they played in Dublin. We filled what was then near Lansdowne Road. And we've, Keith and I and others have had many great days, but nothing came close to that. Some of the greatest players in world rugby, some of these great figures, had come and lent their name to support of those who are working for peace on this island. And after the end of the game, as they did a lap of honour, the whole stadium rose as one. It was an amazing, it was an amazing day. And their guests of honour were children whose lives had been, had been just seriously impacted by the Troubles. A little boy called Darren Baird, who lost both his parents in the Shankill Road bombing. Tommy Mullen, who lost his brother in the Rising Sun reprisals and attack in Greysteel. And Gareth Bowlesworth, whose best friend Tim Parry was killed in Warrington. They, they, this was an extraordinary, extraordinary day of extraordinary em emotion. But it just showed uh, many of the people who came to the game had never been to a rugby match in their life, had never been to Lansdowne Road or the, what's now the Aviva Stadium. But they came that day because that was the buttons. And Trevor sometimes talking about the pushing the right buttons and wrong buttons. And someone who loves this place and is now his ambassador um, to, 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 to the United States, he constantly talks about pushing the right buttons and not the wrong buttons, something I've, I've learned uh, from him. So what do we need to do? We need to build mutual respect and understanding without threatening anybody's sense of identity. We need to maximize the potential of bodies such as the North-South Ministerial Council and the British-Irish Council. I believe the Shared Island Initiative in the Department of the Taoiseach has displayed genuine aspirations and real potential. Last week I sat on about four sessions, the first in, in, anniversary of the initiative. I listened to a number of talks on all island climate action, growth of trade and services, potential for mutual learning for not-profit organisations island-wide. These were just the latest in a series of very constructive, non-threatening in terms of identity initiatives. And this is despite it having real difficulties in not being able to meet uh, th through COVID. There is a, what do we do? Civic groups such as Cooperation Ireland, the Ireland Funds, the BIA and the Irish Association are important and perhaps can look to see what they expand their activities. And one of the things that we're looking at in the British Irish Association is can we take the power, the convening power, as you, you would well appreciate, and spread that and share that into other events with the aims and the goals over the course of the year. And we look, we look, we look further for this. There, there is role for real, there's real, real citizens' assemblies. Much greater progress needs to be made, made on integrated education. It seems like from the first time we started going here, and I know it's complex and it's, it's difficult at times, but we have to, there has to be potential for more than what the percentage is at the moment. And the real focus on working class areas where the prospects of, of so many remain stubbornly low. Um, I would highlight a recent victory for Northern Ireland, and I would salute Conor Houston, who is behind in, in driving this, where, Ireland, where Northern Ireland and Belfast has been chosen as the host city for One Young World in 2023. One Young World is the largest global gathering of young social activists and the only event in the world, apart from uh, the Olympics, that has a representative from every, every uh, country in that world. And why was Belfast chosen for that? It was chosen because of its humour. It was chosen because of its resilience. It was chosen because the warmth of its welcome. 
and its complicated history and the lessons that can be learned. And salute to Connor and everybody else who is, was involved in that and privileged to be on their advisory board and just welcome. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful event when it happens uh, in 2023. So in conclusion, I'd say Northern Ireland has been a huge part of my life. I love the place and its people, all its people. I have such fun and such a friendship that I've learned so much from it. And I've learned the sort of the best of loyalism, Ulster loyalism at its best. We have a young son who's got medical issues. And apart from our immediate family, nobody has called us more frequently than Keith Crossan and Joanna's wife, Trevor Ringland and Colleen, Nigel Carr and, and, and June. And just to see how, see how he is. I've seen that Ulster loyalism at its best. Someone is pushing the, the right buttons. And I, I've always received nothing except a good welcome when I come up there. And that's not just because I'm sort of an, an Irish international. So to achieve, in conclusion, true reconciliation and tolerance, we need civic and political leadership. Who on the nationalist side is consistently reaching out with, to unionists with a positive, inclusive view about the future? Who on the unionist side is consistently doing that as well? We are seeing the growth of the middle ground and who increasingly don't want to be described in, in that way. True reconciliation and mutual respect will build a Northern Ireland that it works better for all its citizens. It's also the absolute requirements for the longer term constitutional ambitions of both major traditions and those defining as neither. This is a big prize for everyone, a prize worth going for. Thank you very much.